Now, before we begin, I'm going to play you a popular TV theme tune, which I'm sure you have all heard at some point. That was the intro theme tune to the iconic TV show The Twilight Zone, which first aired in 1959 and was created by Rod Serling. The Twilight Zone took viewers on a bizarre journey into the unknown with a different story each episode, which delved into some very strange plots and genres such as fantasy, science fiction, suspense and horror, with a twist at the end that would often send a chill up your spine. It was a huge success spanning many years. The first series was shot entirely in black and white and ran for five seasons from 1959 to 1964 and contained a massive 156 episodes. Years later in the early 80s, it was decided that the Twilight Zone franchise deserved its very own movie, an anthology movie produced by none other than Steven Spielberg and John Landis, who would also direct two of the four short stories that featured in the movie, whilst the other two stories were directed by Joe Dante and George Miller. And the movie also boasts some top acting talent such as Dan Aykroyd, Albert Brooks, Scatman Crawford, John Lithgow, Kathleen Quinlan and Vic Morrow. The movie would also feature some original series cast members such as Burgess Meredith, Patricia Berry, Peter Brocco, Murray Matheson, Kevin McCarthy, Bill Mummy and William Shallot, with Meredith taking over the role of Serling and becoming the narrator. This movie was supposed to pay homage to the TV series, a celebration. Instead, it kind of tarnished the name of The Twilight Zone when a tragedy occurred on the set of the story John Landis was directing involving the death of actor Vic Morrow and two small children in an accident that could have been avoided. Landis was directing a segment of the movie named Time Out. In the movie, Vic Morrow plays Bill Connor, a very bitter gentleman who is in a foul mood after a Jewish co-worker was given the promotion he badly wanted. As he sits at the bar sipping his drink, we quickly learn that Bill is a little bit of a racist, as he badmouths Jews, Blacks and East Asians. A black man in the bar requests that Bill stop, which antagonises him some more as he fires off the insults. But eventually, he leaves a bar, and here is where the familiar Twilight Zone plot kicks in. As Bill steps out of the bar, he is suddenly transported back in time to World War II in France, which is overrun by Nazis. Bill is then confronted by some German soldiers and questioned, but Bill can't speak German, so he decides to make a run for it and is eventually shot and falls from a ledge now falling into the 1950s timeline and seems to be in the middle of a Ku Klux Klan lynching and for some reason Bill is now in the body of a black man. He tries in vain to tell them that he is white but he can see it's no use so he makes a run for it trying to escape once again by jumping into a lake and when he resurfaces he is now in the Vietnam War. After being shot at by some American soldiers he is thrown by an explosion of a grenade that once again sends him through time this time back to World War II France, where he is captured by the enemy and placed in a rail cart with many Jewish prisoners who are on their way to the concentration camps. Just before the episode ends, Bill spots his friends stood outside the bar and he shouts for them, but it's no good. They can't hear him. He is lost in time and the train departs. Now that is a version of this movie which you can actually purchase. They actually released this movie despite the act of Vic Morrow dying. But there was another scene that was planned to give the character of Bill Connor a bit of redemption by showing that deep down he wasn't a bad person. It was in this scene that Vic Morrow and the two children would die. Now in this scene we was going to see the character of Bill transported to Vietnam in a deserted village. In this village he finds two scared children who have been left behind and he decides to save them when an American helicopter shows up and fires upon Bill and the two children as they try to cross a river. Now, as Vic Morrow was crossing this river, he had a child under each arm. Let me take you back to that fateful night on set of the movie. Landis had decided that this extra scene was needed to redeem the character somewhat, and he had come up with the idea that the character of Bill Connor would save two Vietnamese children. The only problem was Landis didn't have any child actors for the part, and instead of doing things officially, he decided to hire the two children under the table, so to speak, cash in hand to the parents. By doing this, California's child labor laws were broken by hiring seven-year-old Micah Din Lee and six-year-old Renee Shin Yi Shen. Now, it was young Renee's uncle who was asked by a friend whose wife was a production secretary of the film if he knew of any children they could cast. It was then that Shen thought of his brother's six-year-old Renee and her parents agreed to let her take part. Then Renee's uncle also asked another friend 
Daniel Lee, who had a seven-year-old son named Micah. Micah was said to be a happy child who enjoyed posing for the camera, so a chance to be in a Hollywood movie was a great idea. Unfortunately, they had absolutely no idea what kind of scene the children were going to be involved in. They simply were not informed. The shoot took place at around 2.30am on July the 23rd, 1982. Now, children were not allowed to shoot at night, especially at such a time. But this didn't concern Landis, who had paid the parents under the table for this very reason, and to avoid being told no by the studio. Another reason Landis decided to keep it a secret was due to the fact that Vic Morrill would be carrying the two children across this river as very large explosions were being detonated from either side of the set, sending huge fireballs up into the air as a helicopter hovered a mere 25 foot above the actor and the children, and the studio would have definitely refused such a dangerous stunt involving children. The filming location was Indian Dunes, a movie ranch in the Valencia neighborhood of what is now the city of Santa Clarita, California. Now, this location had been used in many other movies and it was ideal for shooting night scenes. It was vast and there was no light pollution. It was perfect for Jan Landis to recreate this fictional village in the fictional Vietnam. On the night of the shoot, the helicopter being piloted by Vietnam War veteran Dorsey Wingo hovered above the set, flying low to get into the shot. Action was shouted, and Vic Morrow started to make his way across a shallow river with a child under each arm. Pyrotechnic explosions went off around him, and the force of the rotor blades lashed at the water below. Vic Morrow was maybe halfway across whilst the director Landis was shouting for the helicopter to get lower, which was already at a mere 25 feet over the actor and the children. Now, before I go any further, I don't think I'm doing this justice explaining how hellish this scene looked. You can actually view it on YouTube. I'll get into that a little bit later. The actor was crossing the river. The helicopter was hovering a mere 25 feet above. The water was being lashed up by the rotor blades, like I said, and explosions were going off all around the actor and the children. So as you can imagine, to actually wade through that water, shallow or not, would have been a feat in itself. The mere force of the rotor blades blowing onto the actors would have been another element. The water splashing up against him would have been something else he was fighting against. And then there was the enormous explosions that were going off all around them. And I'll remind you that the parents of the children did not know what kind of scene the children were going to appear in. And John Landis was actually keeping the children out of sight of the fire safety officer on set. So if anything, this just goes to show that Landis knew he would not get away with this shot. He would not get away with doing the scene involving two children because it was just too damn dangerous. The pilot repositioned the copter, turning it 180 degrees to get into the next shot when another explosion erupted, catching the tail end of the helicopter, causing the rear rotor to fail and the pilot lost control and the helicopter began to spin. At the same time, Vic Morrow dropped little Shen into the water and turned back to pick her up when the helicopter came down on all three of them. The main rotor blades decapitated Vic Morrow and Lee, whilst the little girl Shen was crushed by the right landing skid, killing all three instantly. Obviously, the scene was not used in the finished movie, although scenes recorded by Vic Morrow still remain in the movie. According to Landis, this was out of respect to the actor. No scenes of the children are, of course, in the movie. Now, after the accident, a lengthy investigation went underway questioning John Landis and his irresponsible ways of running a movie set and his disregard for his actors and human life in general. Shockingly, in the investigation, it was revealed in a testimony by a camera operator that Landis had been warned of the dangers of the explosions and flying the helicopter too low, to which he simply responded, we may lose the helicopter. The shot seemed to be the only thing he was interested in. It's unclear if Landis was joking when he made this comment, but he was known for ignoring suggestions from the crew. The parents also testified that they were given no indication that their children would be in a scene with so much explosions, let alone a low hovering helicopter. During the court case, the pilot of the helicopter actually said that Vic Morrow had a five second window to actually get out of the way of the helicopter. Now, if you were to watch the video on YouTube, and I do not recommend it, but if you did, you would quickly realize that Vic Morrow, who was holding two children 
under each arm in knee high water at absolutely no chance in hell of moving out of the way of the incoming helicopter. Although I will say this, the pilot did claim that he was not blaming Vic Morrow, but I think you will agree it is quite a ridiculous thing to say. The parents of the children eventually did settle in court and walked away with compensation, but of course, without their children, whilst John Landis simply walked away a free man. Title of court and cause. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, John Landis, not guilty of involuntary manslaughter, as charged in count one of the amended information. I'm shocked. I'm appalled, I'm disappointed because I believe that the conduct clearly was, as I said before, I don't want to sound repetitious, was about as reckless as it can get. The whole court case was bewildering to say the least. John Landis never actually took any blame for the accident and in most interviews seemed to be more interested with the effect the whole tragedy had on his career. The following quote is from an actual interview Landis took back in 1996. There was absolutely no good aspect of this whole story. The tragedy, which I think about every day, had an enormous impact on my career, from which I may possibly never recover. An amazing, unbelievable statement, I'm sure you will agree. It seemed like the only thing this man was concerned with was his own career. Although this statement that Landis gave in court does show a little bit of remorse from the director. If anyone had ever thought that such a horrendous thing could happen, obviously we would have stopped. And uh, this is a terrible, terrible accident that obviously will cause pain and anguish to all of us for the rest of our lives. And this was a statement that the pilot of the helicopter gave after being after being proven not guilty. Well, it was just a wonderful time, and uh, I wish we could get the jurors uh, close for a minute. I, I want to kiss at least half of them and hug the rest. Uh, we're just astounded, and uh, we're very grateful. After the accident, Steven Spielberg, who was good friends with Landis, broke off his friendship with the director. Some say Spielberg did this to just ensure that his own career remained intact, although Spielberg did say the following, and I believe this is a good way to end today's episode. The crash made me grow a little, and left everyone who worked on the movie sick to the centre of our souls. No movie is worth dying for. I think people are standing up much more now than ever before to producers and directors who ask too much. If something isn't safe... It's a right and responsibility of every actor or crew member to yell, cut. <laughs>